So where are we now? I mean, we've got a view that is stunning, but this is the grand staircase in Northern Arizona. And it's looking off about 50 miles northward into Utah. We're looking up near uh, Bryce and Zion National Parks. And we're seeing the Vermilion Cliffs, the uh, Red Cliffs in the foreground. Then behind them, somewhat concealed, is the White Cliffs, yep. and that's sandstone. And behind that is the Gray Cliffs. And we see these sequence of cliffs. Each of those cliffs is a layer of the crust of the Earth and that it has its own history. Each layer came from a different direction. The sediment was not from this location, it was swept in from somewhere else. And the process of transport created the different types of sediment in this one location, including the different colors. So you're saying most of the, the, the rock that we see here was sediment, but it was brought in from some place a long way away? Well, let's take the one we're standing on right here. We have the, uh, the Kaibab limestone, mm -hmm. which is made out of uh, small calcium carbonate grains that uh, were dispersed in water and that were there to trap all kinds of, of fossil creatures like coral, brachiopods, uh, crinoid material, ocean yeah. creatures. And so we're standing here on this limestone. Then the next layers up are the kind of reddish layers above, right out here. And those reddish of vermilion cliffs are made out of volcanic ash, probably from Mexico, swept in here by current, floating logs. And we have petrified logs. Most of the red petrified wood in most people's collections largely is from the Shinley Formation that forms the vermilion cliffs. Let me stop you for a second because that is a huge layer. I mean, that red layer out there, that's the one you're talking about, right? Yes. That's a, that's a huge layer. And that was, that was transported here from Mexico. Yeah, it's volcanoes somewhere and it's not here in the United States. Uh -huh. so, so where did it come from? And we can tell which direction the sediment is coming from by the current indicators. So somewhere in Mexico. And you can see it in Amarillo, Texas. Okay, and Palo Duro Canyon, you can follow this layer all the way up here into the Colorado Plateau and up into the Rocky Mountains all the way up to Canada. It's very, uh, very widespread. So these layers that we're looking at, they're not just uh, local. They're not just, oh, some rocks get exposed here. They go on for quite a ways. Yes. Okay, so now tell me about the story of the, of the layer that's above the red layer. Uh, that's the uh, Navajo sandstone, and that's the primary white cliff. The white cliff is in Zion National Park, and that has layers inside of it, diagonal layers that are called cross beds. And those cross bedded sandstone shows you evidence of current moving sand as massive dunes. And dunes 60, maybe 100 feet high, moving underwater as currents are sweeping along sand grains in a deep ocean. Well, all that you're saying here uh, seems to be somewhat contrary to the, to the story that we were told in schools and in colleges and so forth. Uh, that story is, sounds more of a very calm, placid situation where we have, we have a, a, an ocean and then we have material sprinkling down. You're talking about something much more tumultuous here. Yes, not thousands of years per inch accumulation rates, but accumulation uh, inches and feet in minutes or hours. So, so the sedimentary layers that we're looking at here, it's liquid, it's flowing in here, I suspect at a fairly rapid rate as well, and then it's depositing those layers rapidly. Yeah. And how does it become rock? I mean, most people look at rock and they think, well, rock is rock and it goes all the way back. Yeah, well, just simply squeezing the water out compacts the sediment. And then once it's loaded with the weight of what's above it, and there was a lot of sediment on, on top of it, that squeezes the pressure and the temperature increases slightly. And there's probably minerals seeping out of the earth underneath. And silica and carbonate are the two materials that, that are the primary cements of these rocks that we're looking at here. And uh, that we can make them in the laboratory. Uh, we can make uh, fossils and, and, uh, and, and, and cement grains together to make rock fast. You mean in a short period of time we can actually create rock and, and fossilize yes, things? Yes. In the hot springs of Yellowstone, 
uh, we tied a rope around a log and immersed it in one of those hot springs and pulled the log out after a couple weeks. And you could see the effect of silica infiltrating and mm. cementing the log. Not only the log, but the rope fossilized, essentially. So you're, you're starting to get a petrified tree, huh? Yeah, and there are trees at Yellowstone that are dying because they're being petrified. Mm. The roots are petrifying. Mm. And uh, that's, a, that's an unusual story. Yeah. But uh, even, even today, the process happens rapidly when we see it. Coal can form rapidly, and oil can be, uh, can be manufactured in a rapid way. Mm. Those are all things that we can think about as we look at rock strata layers. When you look around the world then, uh, is this just unique here, or do we find the same kind of layers, maybe not the same layers, but the same kind of layers all over the world? We do, we find uh, similar layers to the Vermilion Cliffs over in Europe hmm. and elsewhere. Let me try to get my mind around this because we're talking about uh, the globe is now covered in some cases with what, up to three miles thick of sedimentary layer. And that thick uh, set of sedimentary layers all around the globe, what does that tell a geologist? Uh, it's a deep flood, uh -huh. and, it's, and it's over the continents. And um, that is uh, uh, something completely extraordinary, okay? But, you know, the story we were told is that the ocean uh, advanced and retreated over the North American continent 17 different times yeah, to make the 15,000 feet of strata that we see right here in the uh, Grand Staircase. Is that, is that the continent rising and sinking? Is that how that It happened? could be the continent rising or sinking and the ocean floor uh, deepening and, and whatever. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a hard to imagine story with, you know, a sustained over hundreds of millions of years as, as that type of thing's going on. What's really bothers me is the character of the sediment that we see mm -hmm. here. The sedimentary rocks do not have the character of a river delta or a reef or a beach. The beach deposits are quite different than the sands that we see over here. And so things just look different. And uh, that story of the calm and placid sea is kind of junk food for my brain. It doesn't work in explaining rock. Okay, and what I need to look for is the real uh, catastrophic process and, and co uh, uh, colossal uh, water process that formed these rocks. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about the power of water being able to also in itself uh, transform the landscape. Yes, uh, the power of water is colossal. It can pulverize sediment. It can sweep up sediment into slurry flow, like mud flows. Uh, gravity can take over and it can slide all around. Uh, the uh, power of moving water, simply just the, uh, the, the currents that the flood created can sweep water into uh, making enormous uh, sand dunes mm -hmm. and uh, features like that. And of course, uh, mud can be swept up and deposited to make these mud flow like limestone layers. So sandstone, limestone, and shale layers like we see here uh, very uh, widespread, argue for no calm and placid sea. Uh, this is a catastrophic event. Well, let me go back and let's kind of step through uh, what's happening because uh, the scripture, which is so much of, a, of, a, of an understatement, you know, it, it says, and they crucified him. Uh, and we have the flood, and to some extent, the flood uh, gives us a picture of an ark that's floating on the top. But there's something catastrophic happening uh, down underneath. Can you kind of walk us through the steps you think that were going on uh, from your perspective? Probably ocean floor faulting started the, the flood. All the fountains of the Great Deep are broken up on a single day. Are those fountains of water? Is that uh, maybe molten material? Do we know? Well, we have 10,000 seafloor volcanoes in the Pacific uh -huh. Basin. So the primary cause of Noah's flood is the seafloor upheaval. Hmm. And the secondary cause, maybe obvious from Noah's perspective, is the unleashing of this uh, colossal rainstorm. The, the ocean probably rose, and there were probably some very severe waves, but once the water covered the earth, the ocean surface itself would be rather stable, but it's all the sediment that's being moved around under the ocean 
that's the real action area that's creating the layers that we see. And it's all of those currents and mud flows and everything else that's happening underneath that ends up laying down all of these sediment layers all over the world. Yeah. And then it says at the 150th day of Noah's flood, the waters assuaged or, or retreated and the ark landed. But it took, another, it took seven months for the waters to subside before Noah could get out of the ark. So the year-long, world-destroying flood of colossal scale is uh, very evident here as we're thinking of these things. Well, how do all these layers get exposed here? Because this is a unique place, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so we have a sequence of events here. Sedimentation, the process of accumulation of liquid grains and with water, then the burial and uh, the making of the, of the layers uh, preserved in the earth, making rock layers. And then, then this whole area was uplifted or tilted. Here in the Grand Staircase, the strata were uplifted in northern Arizona slightly inclined and it makes the inclined layers that allow us to see 10,000 feet of strata extending off 50 miles into uh, southern Utah. So the uplift or the upwarp, the Kaibab upwarp in northern Arizona is the, the tectonic feature that created the inclination of the strata and then the beveling of the surface okay. by the retreat of the flood. So then we had to acquire the present Colorado River drainage basin and all that more uh, normal kind of things that we have today. Mm -hmm. so, so things have really changed. And that's kind of the, the summary of what we see here. So we have the sedimentation and, and then we have the, the, tectonics. the tectonics going on. And then we have erosion. Mm -hmm. And then we see lots of volcanoes, especially in the high country up by Bryce Canyon. And then we see everything shutting down everything goes into decline and uh, mud flows diminish with time. Water erosion of the surface declines with time. Tectonics and earthquakes uh, decrease with time. And, uh, and then we acquire the present world that we see. And even after the waters have receded, it sounds like you're saying that the earth is still kind of trembling for a while. There's still a, there's a decay to that. And exponential decay is the way, the way I uh, say it technically, mm -hmm. is uh, the catastrophic process at the end of the flood didn't just shut down immediately, it went into, into decline. And it declined into the post-flood period. And we can see some of the post-flood uh, features here. Uh, it wasn't very easy immediately after the flood to be out here with with catastrophic mm -hmm. mass wasting of these mountains that are uplifting and that kind of thing. And of course, breaching of dams, making giant canyons. So uh, that's the, the story. Sedimentation, tectonics, erosion, volcanoes, exponential decline. And the exponential decline has then led to um, today in the present where we see uh, gradual processes Yes. And that's what the story that we are told in the school says, that's how it was all the way back. Right. So mm -hmm. do we extrapolate the present into the past or do we let the past speak for itself and then understand the present different? Steve, it's obvious that you love this kind of stuff. Is it easy being a creation scientist in our world? It's not easy. You got to swim against the current, if you will. What does that but, look like? Uh, when I made decisions to pursue this line of thinking, uh, I discovered that it's valuable. There were people that said, if you continue to think the way you're thinking, you will not be of value as a geologist. Why would they say that? Uh, because they were uh, kind of customary, business as usual, um, you know, um, slow and gradual process is the way the earth formed. Don't tell us a different story. They are not looking for that. And uh, so I'm looking for a different story and I can find very interesting uh, some things that aren't even controversial that are exceptional that allow them to rethink their way of thinking. I went to school in the 1960s, graduated got a master's degree and PhD in geology during a time when there was this uh, reticence 
to believe in catastrophic process. You found resistance? Re and resistance. But over the years, that's changed enormously. And uh, professors that usually question my way of thinking have now come alongside of my way of thinking. And people who once, um, what would you say, um, dismissed me, now learn to tolerate me or even encouraging me. And why are they doing that now? What's making that change? The whole field of geology is becoming more softened uh, to uh, catastrophist thinking. Is and that because you're a very persuasive person or is there something else, which you no, are, no, but is something else going on? No, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the earth, the real earth. And when you think outside the box, you, um, uh, and, and, and with this line of thinking, you become productive. Okay, and it's kind of bland and boring geology thinking about only the present forming some things around us. But when you start looking at the whole group of features that could be possible for forming layers like we see here, then people not only tolerate me, they encourage and, and encourage me to do my best work. Steve, let's, let's suppose that you had an opportunity to talk to some, some young folks uh, and maybe they uh, were leaning a little towards science. They, they had some interest in that. Uh, is this a time that you would encourage them uh, to enter into science or would you discourage them? Well, of course, there's this um, establishment of uh, resistance to uh, fiat creation and the global flood. Okay, the framework of scripture is somewhat intolerant in their thinking. But you can live that way and, and explain things that way and, uh, and, and, and do good work. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think it, uh, I think there's room for creation science to do very good work. Research, publication, and teaching. So they may uh, find some resistance, but we find resistance all over the world, don't we? Yeah. In all different areas. Yeah. And, uh, but it's a battle, but uh, God has given us this earth as a testimony to him. Mm -hmm.